Hi, River of Life Church. Thank you so much for joining us today in the Sunday after Resurrection Sunday. We celebrated at Easter the resurrection of Christ with the third in our series called The Cross. And the title of the talk on Easter Sunday was Risen, Really? And the title of today's, the fourth in this series, is Returning. Really? And then next week, the last in the series called The Cross is called Judgment. Really? These are three massive foundational Christian theologies that are quite extraordinary. In fact, often we don't realize how radical it is to truly believe that Jesus rose from the dead that Jesus will return for his bride and that a day of judgment is coming for all mankind. And radical and fundamental as these are to believe, it is a really good exercise to wrestle through the scriptures and say, where do I stand on this? And there's other aspects that we could have spoken about, the immaculate conception of Jesus. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a peasant woman. Or that he lived a sinless life. All his teaching. and But these three messages together, so vitally important. Do you really believe that Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven? Do you really believe that he is returning at a predetermined moment by the Father for the bride? And do you believe that there will be judgment for all mankind? I'd love us to dive in at Matthew chapter 24 today. And we're going to read scripture. I'm pretty much just going to let the scriptures speak for themselves. And as I was preparing for this message, I came to the topic wondering, did Jesus actually speak about his return? Did he speak about it much? Does it feature much? And I was amazed at the volume that Jesus, the apostles, and Revelation carries on the subject. So we're just going to let the scripture speak, and then I'm going to draw out four points to challenge us, and that'll lead into next week on judgment. Father, thank you so, so much that you have given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of you and your great and precious promises. Thank you that we can go to the scriptures and be illuminated. That as we read your word, faith rises in our hearts and you empower us. You transform us. You cause us to live as disciples and enable us to make disciples of others. And Father, we pray that as we go to the scriptures today, that your word would speak to every heart. That your word would cause the lordship of Jesus to be extended, the rule of Christ in every heart. And that you would help through the gift of preaching for real life change. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're in Matthew chapter 24, this is Jesus speaking. And uh, he's already spoken a lot about his return But here in verse 42 of Matthew 24, he says, Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? And Jesus continued with more teachings through Matthew 25 of this theme of the master going and then returning. The next one is the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went 
to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish took their lamps, but no oil with them. The wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, He is here, the bridegroom has come. And all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, Since there won't be enough for all of us, go, and go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom arrived. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. And afterwards the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Jesus carries on the parable of the talents, very similar theme. A master is going and he gives talents to each of his servants and goes to a faraway land and they all do what they do with the talents and he returns for a reckoning of what has happened. And that leads to this teaching at the end of Matthew 25, verse, 30, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left, and then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to me. I do want these scriptures to speak for themselves, and I resist jumping in and commenting. But just two quick comments here. When Jesus returns and becomes the judge of all men, and we will look at this in more detail next week, the only thing that will count on that day is character, faith expressed in love. On that day, nothing else of this world will matter but how we have acted towards others. Our relationship with God, our relationship with man, and the world which he has created. The character of our lives. And the other thing that I want to point out is how humble Jesus is. How he is comfortable to associate with the most marginalized of our society. He says, when you visited in prison, you visited me. When you cared for the sick, you cared for me. When you clothed the naked, you clothed me. This king who we serve is not some far off, remote, hard to know concept, but a man who is identified with our sorrows, earthed in the mess of our lives, though he himself has contributed none of that mess, but has taken it all upon him that we, may be healed and saved. The judgment, the second coming of Christ and the judgment reveals the sheer love of God. Uh, further on from Matthew, let's go to John. There's much more in Mark and Luke and you can study it on your own if you want to. Just uh, uh, do a Bible study on the return of Christ. But John chapter 14 is one of the ones that we would know well and a verse that you'll know well, but maybe you didn't know it came in this context. John 14, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Woo! And you know the way to where I'm going. 
Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You may have known that verse. John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, the context is Jesus' return. That he's saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you, all those who have put their faith in me, and at an appointed time, I will return and take you to be with me. And you know the way. And we sit and say, oh, do we really know the way to where he has planned a place for us? The answer to that is yes, if you know Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Out of the Gospels into Acts. Uh, John carries on talking about the return of Christ, but you can look at it yourself. I'm going to look at Acts chapter 1. This was foundational to the teaching of the early church, and it's in the context of the ascension of Christ. And we haven't spoken about that much. We've kind of jumped from the resurrection to the second coming. But there's some amazing stuff that's happening in between the ascension and the glorification of Jesus before his return. And this uh, passage refers to that a little bit. Verse 8, but you will receive power, verse 8 of chapter 1, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This was a hope that the disciples had. Once they had seen the resurrected Jesus and received the great commission to go into all the world and make disciples, they watched him ascend into heaven saying, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then he disappeared. And then these two angels said the same way he has gone, he will come back. And you can imagine, they felt on duty. They felt the fulfillment of Matthew 25. They've been given talents. They've got a job to do. They've got to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samir. Let's get on with it. Why? Because he's going to come back. He's going to check out everything we've been doing. Now, first thing we've got to do is wait for the pouring out of his Holy Spirit. And that happened in Acts chapter 2. And once they received the Spirit, boy, they were on mission. And we've been on this mission ever since, awaiting His return. Again, Acts refers to this over and over. Uh, you can study it. We're going to dive into one scripture in, in, in an epistle, and that's in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And it says... Uh, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, Encourage one another with these words. The context of this is the reality of death, the reality of persecution and suffering and hardship. And the encouragement of the apostle inspired by the Holy Spirit is not that if you have enough faith, you will receive money sovereignly into your bank account. Or if you have enough faith, you will be uh, absolutely healed and you'll never have any physical problem. There's none of that. There is trusting God for miracles, trusting God for deliverance, but an acknowledgement that in this world we will have trials and hardships of many kinds and all face death. 
and gloriously. When he returns, the dead in Christ will rise first. And those who are living as he returns will be caught up with them and will see him as he is. Encourage one another with these words. Through death, we will know our healing and our salvation. Hebrews is probably the most emphatic of these encouragements. Hebrews 9 verse 28, and I sometimes think it's because none were persecuted more than this group of people. The Jews in Rome. Hebrews 29 verse 28 says, uh, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Possibly the most distilled articulation of the second coming. In the context of the redemption of sin, he is coming back not to deal with sin, it's done once and for all, but to receive those who are eagerly awaiting him. Revelation first chapter and Revelation last chapter. Revelation 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, let it be. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and is to come, the Almighty. I don't know if you've noticed, but many of the scriptures that I've read use this word, all, all the angels, all those who died in faith, all of us who are alive in faith will. And here it says, uh, every eye will see him, all tribes of the earth. And this is the reality that none will miss out on this. All the angels will be there when Jesus appears. Uh, it's sometimes when I visit churches and I take a person with me, I'm accorded even more respect because I'm with my peeps. Or I, I take two or three traveling companions and there's just a different vibe. There is going to be a day where the one who is worthy of all honor and glory will come with all his people, all the angels, all believers, even those who don't believe, will see and bow their knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is where all of history is heading. The very last chapter of the very last book of the Bible the very last verses. Revelation 22 verse 17. The spirit and the bride say come. Let the one who hears say come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. And the very last verse. 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things says surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. It's so interesting that the theme of the return of Christ is not always something that we live with in the front of our minds. I think sometimes we, we have an idea that there's a judgment coming one day and we're not exactly sure how that's going to go. We're covering that next week. But there is this huge New Testament theme that the apostles were pumping, that Jesus was emphasizing, that it is so important for us to live in the good of. And so as we close, I'd love to just draw out four points from these scriptures to have clearly logged in our minds as reference points. Firstly, there will be a sudden, visible, bodily return of Jesus Christ. Jesus will be here among us again. And in the wisdom of God, 
our relationship with Him will be intimate, more intimate than the closest marriage on earth. It's not like we will be one of multitudes of angels and multitudes of people that know Him and see Him from a distance. Somehow in the wisdom of God, the bodily experience of Jesus, we will know Him, we will see Him as He is, we ourselves will be changed in an instant. We will see His hands, we will see His feet, we will see His sides. We will know Him personally. We will know the Father, we will know the Spirit, we will know the Son. Secondly, we should long for His return. These scriptures all point to the fact that we should eagerly await, be ready is the main theme, be on our toes, long to see Him as a bride longs to see her groom or as a groom longs to see her bride. It is a relationship of love. If Christians either enjoy the world too much or fear the world too much and are in anxiety and depression, both of those can distract us from the hope in Christ. The golf and the gambling and whatever else and drunkenness and whatever you, money, sex, power, whatever the world offers, if we get immersed beyond the, the place that these things should have in our lives, they distract us from our primary devotion. And similarly, fear hounds out love. Anxiety cripples. We can have such confidence through whatever challenges we are going that he will never test us beyond what we can bear. And we can eagerly await his return. He will sustain us through everything that we will face as we continue to believe in him. Thirdly, we do not know when he will return. And that's so important to lock. There are many theories as to uh, the rapture, the millennium, the tribulation. There's, there's so many different theories. The reality is none of those are salvation issues. They are all of secondary importance. The issue, the primary issue is that Jesus is returning. It may be before a lot of suffering. It may be after a lot of suffering. It may be before a rapture. It may be after a rapture. There's post-tribulation, pre-tribulation, post-rapture, pre-millennial. All the various theories you can get. Important thing, we don't know exactly when. And lastly, be ready. We do know that after his return, there will be judgment. We will cover that next week. The best thing that we can do is to be ready. We should be ready for Christ's return at any moment. It may be that all the prophetic fulfillment of prerequisites for Christ's return have been fulfilled already. It may be that there's still some to come. Where I sit, I do think there is going to be a great tribulation. I think there is going to be an intensity of opposition to those in faith. And I think there is going to be an increasing darkness and rule of the Antichrist, which will also be associated with great revival, with a great turning to Christ and many Jews coming to him. That's, where, that's what I think. I think Jesus is going to come back maybe in 15 years or 25 years, somewhere there. Maybe 35. <laughs> I don't know. But I think he's going to tarry a little bit. And I think the church is going to face some fire. That is what I feel. But I could just as easily imagine the trumpet call go in the next four seconds. Imagine. And Jesus would be true to every word he's ever spoken. I want to leave you with one last scripture, and this is massively encouraging. It speaks of uh, some dramatic moments that I think we should be ready for as well. That if the fire gets more intense, even the heavens give way. We need to be strong and expectant. Listen to how Jesus says it. Luke chapter 21, verse 25. And there will be signs, actually we'll go from verse 20. 
But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are inside the city depart. Let those who are out in the country enter it. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for the women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. For there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against its people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars. And on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And here's your verse. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. I think that is such a distillation of the teaching of the New Testament that God never takes us out of the discomfort, but provides a way for us through the discomfort with an eternal hope of a day that is coming, that in Him every tear will be wiped away. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more pain. There will be no more death. Lord Jesus, I... Thank you so much that your word provokes us, sobers us, brings revelation to the reality of the lives that we are living, created in the image of God, eternal beings with such responsibility on planet earth that we're not like monkeys or dogs or dolphins. You have created us with a mandate and a responsibility. And I pray that these verses would find a place deep in our hearts and that you would give us wisdom on how to carry oil through this life, how to be in your word and in your spirit, be part of your body, the church, keep in step with you, that on that day, it would be a day of great joy. And the Spirit and the Bride say, come. We eagerly look forward to your returning and say, Holy Spirit, prepare us as the Bride. We offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Work in us to will and to act according to your good purpose. We pray this individually and for us as a church, as a river of life, that increasingly we would live in the assurance and the hope of your soon return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you next week for judgment, really? God bless you.